It's 2020. It's been a crazy year. And we're going to talk about dealing with worry and anxiety. Twenty twenty has been a crazy year. We're almost at the end of it, but I know a lot of you have been stressing out. The other day, my wife was going around and she was asking teenagers for prayer requests, and she was shocked at how many of our teenagers asked for prayer about school. So many of you were sincerely concerned about your schooling, about your grades and your work. And she could tell that there was a lot of stress. That's not an unnormal thing for a teenager to be worried about their schooling. But if I'm just being honest with you, most of the time when I ask somebody, hey, what can I pray for you about? They go, um, school. <laughs> it's just kind of like they needed something to say. And so school just seemed to fit the best. But my wife was convinced that everybody was very sincerely concerned and worried and anxious about their schooling. And I have noticed with many of our church families, not just our teenagers, but our adults too, there is a lot of anxiousness, a lot of stress, and a lot of worry. A lot of people are carrying these burdens, and it's starting to take a toll on people. And that's just not our church. I think that's a lot of people around the entire globe. This year is one of our most contentious elections that we've had in some time. Of course, we've had the COVID-19. COVID-19! If you haven't experienced COVID-19 or hasn't affected your family directly, you've experienced uh, the indirect effects through quarantines and shutdowns. I've had teenagers tell me they haven't seen some of their best friends in seven months. The last time they seen some of their friends was in March before their school shut down. And so it's tough for a lot of people. And a lot of people are dealing with it in a lot of different ways. There's a lot of discouragement, some anger, frustration, stress, depression. Some people are dealing with it fairly well. But if I'm going to be honest with you, I don't know one single person who the shutdowns have not affected in a negative way. Everybody I know personally, everybody that I work with, everybody that I go to church with has been affected by this in one way or another. And I feel like with our young people and our teenagers, what I'm seeing is an increased level of worry and anxiousness. Most of the time we think the youth pastor wants to make sure that the kids aren't being immoral, they're not doing drugs, and they're not pulling crazy pranks and getting suspended from school. But believe it or not, I actually worry about your spiritual health, your emotional health, and also your mental health. Not just that you're behaving and being good boys and girls. So I see a lot of worry and I see a lot of angst. And so I just wanna talk about it. There's an awesome verse in the book of Proverbs. And as you know, that I've taught before, the book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom. And Proverbs 12, 25 says this, it says heaviness in the heart of a man maketh it to stoop. Our heart is brought lower by heaviness. And that word heaviness can be explained as the worries and the troubles of our life. Some of the sorrows, the stress, and that emotional weight, that heaviness makes our heart to stoop. And that's what worry does. Worry causes a whole lot of problems for us. Worry is like going to your driveway and starting up your car and letting it run for hours. You don't actually go anywhere, you just have it sitting still, but the engine is running. And it's using up all this fuel. And worry is the same way. Worry uses up our emotional fuel, our mental fuel, and even our physical fuel. We will feel physically tired if we spend so much time worrying. But it doesn't get us anywhere. It doesn't help us to solve our problems. It doesn't help the homework to get done when you're just sitting there worried about it. It doesn't do a lot for you. And I think one of the reasons why we worry is because we live in such a controlled day and age where pretty much <laughs> everything that we want is at our fingertips. If you have a smartphone, you can get your favorite TV shows, your favorite movies. If you go on YouTube and you wanna learn about thermodynamics, it's there. Or you just wanna see some silly video or a new music video or the next teaser trailer for a movie that's coming out. If you wanna watch reviews about video games, if you wanna see people craft stuff, 
and make stuff. I mean, think about this. Now that you have DoorDash and Uber Eats and all that stuff, if you really want <laughs> to not go out and leave your home and just have the food come to you, you can. It's just clicks away. So we're used to living in this controlled environment where we have so much control over the stuff that we take in through media, even now just ordering food, and it's all at the touch of our fingertips. So much of what we want is accessible to us, either through the internet. I own on my PlayStation 4, I have over 200 owned video games. And I only own maybe five or six actual discs, but they're all digital. I've downloaded, they're in the cloud. Thus, there's so much in our life that if we want it, we can just order it online. I have Amazon Prime. I can order stuff and two days later, it's at my house, free shipping. It's an amazing day and age that we live in. And I think that we're so used to controlling everything that when there's things that are uncontrollable in our life, we don't know what to do with it. Now, what kind of things are uncontrollable in our life? What are the kind of things that make us worry that we feel like we don't have any power to control whether or not it's gonna turn out negative or positive for us? Well, number one, we worry about the future. We don't know what's gonna to happen tomorrow. I'm recording this and it's election night and everybody on Twitter is freaking out. I'm gonna read you a tweet from Vice President Biden. All right, so here is the tweet by candidate and former Vice President Joe Biden. If we give Donald Trump another four years in the White House, our planet will never recover. Our planet will never recover. It's like, come on, man. If Donald Trump gets a second term, then our world will end. We're so dramatic, man. I'm not even trying to get into the politics, all right? I'm not trying to go pro-Trump or pro-Biden, but I just saw that, it just made me laugh. And I'm sure I can find ones from the other side too. So don't get bogged down in that, okay? My point is everybody is so worried about the future and thinks about it in terms of apocalyptic ending. If this guy becomes president, the world will end. <laughs> Like, come on, chill, people. We got to have a little more hope than that. But that's just kind of where we're living now. Everybody's scared about the future. Maybe it's not politics that bother you. Maybe it's the whole COVID thing. Maybe it's about, okay, what's college going to look like for me next year? If you're going to be successful, you don't want to be a failure someday. And it causes a ton of worry and concern for you. So we all have all these hypothetical situations that we worry about. It's not even reality. There is a quote by the American author Mark Twain. He says, I am an old man and have known a great many troubles, but many of them never, but most of them, really phone. He says, I am an old man and have known a great many troubles, but most of them never happened. He was saying that he has lived a long life, some good times and some bad times. And a lot of the bad times that he's experienced were only in his head. They were just things that he worried about that never came to fruition. All of our worry about the future is hypothetical, meaning that it might happen, but it might not. We don't know for sure. And so we stress ourselves out just dwelling on possibilities that might not even come true. And in fact, probably most of them won't come true. We're so overly concerned and everything in our life, in our head has to go perfectly. And if it's anything less than perfect, then it's awful. <laughs> That's just not how life works. You're gonna have you're gonna have good days and you're gonna have bad days. And none of those days are gonna be perfect, even the good ones. And we can't be just torturing ourselves in our mind, hoping that the next day is absolutely perfect and trying to play out all of the possibilities. We're kind of like Doctor Strange in Infinity War when he sees the 14 million possible endings to their battle with Thanos. It just doesn't work that way. We don't know what's gonna to happen tomorrow. Bible's pretty explicit about that. The other thing that we worry about is our relationships. We worry about are our friendships gonna last? Our parents, are they fighting? They might have a rocky marriage. We worry about our brothers and sisters. Some of them are getting involved into things that they shouldn't be, or our friends. We worry about after high school, will my friends still be my friends? And again, that's just more things that we can't control. And it's just like the future. Relationships aren't perfect either, but sometimes I feel like many of us just stress out 
way too much because of little things that happen in our relationships. Or we stress out about things we can't control in our relationships. You can't control whether or not your parents are gonna split. That's beyond you. And you shouldn't be carrying that weight. You shouldn't be putting that burden on yourself. You can't control whether your friends are gonna do the right thing or do the wrong thing. You can try to encourage them to do the right thing, but ultimately they decide what they're gonna do with their life. So you can't sit there and just worry, worry, worry about things that you can't control, the future and other people in your life. Worry is crippling. Worry is whenever we dwell on problems way too long and it can lead to anxiety and depression. And anxiety and depression can lead to even physical health problems, increased fatigue, heart problems, a loss of appetite, maybe a gain of appetite, loss of sleep. And if you lose sleep, then you gotta deal with all kinds of other issues. Your body's hormones get out of whack and it starts producing more chemicals in your system that it doesn't need. It's generally just not good for you to constantly be anxious and constantly to be depressed. All right, so let's talk about how we are going to worry less. Now, I'm letting you know right now that this does not mean it's gonna eradicate all of your problems. You're still gonna have problems and you're still gonna have concerns and worry. And that's part of life and that's normal. I'm just trying to give you some tools that I believe are gonna help you to deal and cope with the worry and stress that you have in your life. Number one, first, you got to pray. I know it's cliche and I know I say it all the time, but it actually works. There is power in prayer. I do not understand how it works, but I do know that it works. The Bible says this in Philippians chapter four, verse six and seven. It says, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So pray. I do not know how God takes my worries and makes them seem so much smaller when I pray, but he does. And I just have faith in it. I pray because I've seen it work in my life. Now, many of you, you think that prayer is all about, God, please give me a million ducks. <laughs> I said a million ducks. I meant a million bucks. The reason why I said a million ducks is because I was thinking about Scrooge McDuck from DuckTales and Uncle Scrooge was always like worried about money. All right, anyways. So we pray and we say, God, please give me a million bucks. We want the money. And if God doesn't come through and give us all of these tangible things that we see right in front of us, these physical blessings like money, a new car, a new house, PlayStation 5. I don't know what you're praying for. Not going to lie. I am kind of praying for a PlayStation 5. I really don't want to spend money on a PlayStation 5. I'd rather get a new PC. But if God wanted to like airdrop a PlayStation 5 on my front porch, I definitely wouldn't be mad at him. All right, man, I'm so distracted right now. I'm trying to think. Okay, we're back to worry. All right, so, so when I say I've seen God work through prayer, yes, he has actually answered my prayers and provided my physical needs, but I have seen him do so many works inside my own mind and heart. I have given my burdens to him and he has given me peace in return. And I'm thankful for that. That means more to me than money or anything else. What's the use of having all the money in the world and you don't even have peace inside your own soul and your own spirit and your own mind? And so I pray and I ask God to help me through my tough times and he gives me peace. I don't always see how he's going to help me through the tough times. Sometimes it takes a really long time until I see him change my circumstances. But if I am faithful in prayer and I'm consistent in it, I do see God doing a work in my heart. And sometimes that's the change I need the most. I'm gonna give you some wise words from a Christian that I knew, not personally, but I heard him speak many words. And he says, we got to pray just to make it today. That man was MC Hammer and he was like the biggest rapper when I was a kid. And he made a whole song about prayer. He wasn't even a Christian rapper. I mean, he was like a Christian who raps, but he wasn't like Lecrae or anything like that. All I'm saying is this, we got to pray so we can make it today. You have all these worries about school, about your parents, about your friends, and go to God and say, God, please help in this situation. Next, live in the moment. I know that sounds like such a cliche statement. Like, you know, you see those little signs, like my wife sometimes wants to get it, the live, laugh, love decoration and stuff. 
It's so cheesy. If you like it, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to make fun of you. It, there is some real wisdom in living in today. So the Bible says this in Matthew chapter 6, verses 33 and 34. These are famous verses, and it's part of the Sermon on the Mount, and I wish that each and every one of you would actually go for yourself and read these scriptures and the whole passage. It says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So it says, don't be anxious about all the things that you think you need tomorrow. You have enough problems today. Just focus on today and what you're going to do today. Tomorrow's problems will be there tomorrow. Problems are the most patient things in the world. They will wait for you. They don't care how long you take to catch up to them. They will be there waiting for you. So the question to ask yourself is, what can I do today? Even if it's about the things that you are concerned about, that you are worried about, instead of just thinking about it, ask yourself, what am I going to do about it right now today? If you are concerned about Am I going to be successful? Am I going to be able to have a good career when I get older? Okay, what are you doing today? Are you looking into college? Are you looking into trade school? Are you learning something? Or are you just wasting your time sitting there just absolutely racking your brain over these horrible hypotheticals? You could be making real progress in your life, but instead you're allowing fear and worry to cripple you. Figure out what you're going to do today. Live in today. Our problem is that we can be bodily present in this moment, but mentally, we are years away. I'm not against you thinking about your future. What I want you to do is turn down how much you worry about the future. Next, lean on your small group. So, if you're not in a small group, be in a small group. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2, it tells us to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. One of the best things about being in a small group is now you have people around you who are going to support you spiritually. I'm very proud of some of the young ladies in my small group. I have a small group that I lead. It's the juniors and seniors. It's guys and girls. And some of the girls, we were talking about prayer a couple of weeks ago, and they were saying that they have a group message and they encourage each other. They share Bible verses. They challenge one another and they pray for each other. What an awesome thing when you have something that you're worried about, you can't get it past your head. It's not something you can ignore. And you have brothers and sisters in Christ that you can share that burden with. And they're going to lift you up in prayer. And they're going to support you and be there for you. And you can do the same thing for someone else. I really want to challenge all of you to get involved in a small group. And not just to look at your small group as, oh, we just all get on camera and Zoom and we talk about what we learned on the video. That's definitely part of it. But it's not all of it. Your small group is supposed to become a small unit of people, like a family, who say we're going to be there to support and help each other. If you're not involved in a small group, you're missing out. And I really want to encourage you to be involved in the small group. I think it's going to make your life much richer, much better. And I think you're going to make incredible friends. And I think it'll help you with some of the issues that you might be anxious or worry about in your life. The last thing I want to say that I believe will be a help to you is this, when you feel like you are overwhelmed with worry and concern about issues in your life, take some time and help someone else in need. There's multiple ways you can do that. Maybe it's someone personally you know that's going through a tough time. Maybe it's being part of something a little bit bigger. Maybe it's helping to pack food that's gonna to go to another country to help feed people that are starving. Or maybe it's volunteering with uh, Miss Yessie in Hearts in Motion and they're trying to ship medical supplies and all kinds of stuff down to South and Central America to help people in really bad situations. Or maybe it's helping Miss Eva make some keychains so that way she can sell them because we're raising money for Operation Underground Railroad and we're trying to fight human trafficking. And in all those situations, there's people that probably have it worse off than you do. And that's not to discount your suffering. I'm not trying to say that the things you worry about and the things that hurt you in life are not real because they are very real. But sometimes what helps us to put everything in perspective is to realize that there are other people in life that are going through 
sometimes greater suffering than what we experience. It helps us to realize that yes, we do have some tough times, but we also have incredible blessings. And to see how God has helped us and provided for us, it helps us to realize that life is not all about just me and my personal happiness. I love this beautiful verse that Jesus said, where he said, if you would try to find your life, you're gonna lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, then you're gonna find it. And the whole concept is quit trying to find your own personal happiness, but live for God and live for other people. And if you do that, you're gonna find a life that's incredibly abundant in blessing and purpose and meaning and fulfillment. So find a way to be a blessing to someone else. It will help you. I promise you it will help you. We're so self-centered and we're so self-focused. When we can broaden our horizons, and we can broaden our perspective. And we can see that there's other people in the world who are hurting and need help. And that God can use us to be a blessing to someone else's life. That is gonna bring us incredible joy. It doesn't fix all your problems. In fact, none of the things I told you fix all of your problems. They might not fix any of your problems, but what it does is it helps you to get things back into perspective. It helps you to see things a little more like how God sees things. All right, love you guys, proud of you. God bless, have a great evening.